Uh, uh, uh. Boy, I am so excited that the Lord didn't leave me in my bed this morning. Mm-hmm. He this, used to sing that song, he woke me up this morning and started me on my way. What's the rest of that? What more can he do? Uh-huh. Yeah, the Lord is blessing me right now. As you turn it in the scripture to Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel. Uh-huh. Just put it in there in chapter 9. We want to talk a little today about the great applicator. The great applicator. You know, one who apply. Uh huh. The great applicator is none other than faith. Faith is the great applicator. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 22. Verse 22 reads, But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Now, it doesn't take understanding Greek and Hebrew and Chaldean and Aramaic and the tense and the moods, the verbs, all of that, to understand what Jesus said. Jesus told this woman, your faith have made you whole. Your faith made you whole. Your faith made you whole. Now, we can put a spin on it if we want to, but it doesn't change the fact that her faith was the applicator for her healing. Although when we read the narrative, this woman had an internal bleeding condition for 12 years. And uh, the scripture make it plain that um, she decided how she was going to be healed. She said, if I could but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. She didn't say, I'm going to go and stand in a prayer line and uh, then ask him to lay hands on me and prophesy no I'm going to get what I need so the scripture says she had to get through a crowd of people and she got in the press and the press means that there are a lot of folk trying to get to Christ and just like today there are a lot of people trying to get to him but only those who have made up in their heart and mind what the true uh, outcome is going to be. Only those that will be able to get to him. And, um, and a few of the writers have their narrative. But uh, when she touched the hem of his garment, as she said she would do, if I could but touch that garment, I'll be made whole. Uh, he said, who touched me? And the disciples said, Lord, we have enough problems here. People are pushing and shoving you one way and another. And you say, who touched me? There are a whole lot of folk pushing and shoving on Christ. Talking a lot of stuff. But only a few are really in touch with him. Only a few are drawing from him. 
what he has. And the reason why only a few are doing it is because only a few are touching him in faith. Oftentimes we touch him because uh, we're touching him in need. And our need is bigger than the applicator. And whenever the need becomes more important than the faith, then our very problem is our problem. And we need to look at our problems for what they really are. Problems are only problems because they're there to be solved. There's no such thing as a problem without a solution. It's kind of like when I hear about a new invention that man has come up with. I always say in my own mind and heart, God is greater than that. He's greater than that. He said your faith made you whole. And if you turn to chapter 15 of the same gospel of Matthew and pull in there at verse 28. It says here in verse 28, chapter 15. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, anytime you see a big old by itself, that's an amazement. <gasps> oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, the reason I believe that the Lord was in amazement concerning her faith is because this particular woman was not a part of the covenant people. And she was uh, praying to him the wrong prayer. She said, uh, oh Lord, thou son of David, my daughter's grievously back to the tomb. Son of David, what does she have to do with the son of David? She's not a part of the covenant people. And then when Jesus decided, well, look, I've only come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I, you know, I, no, no, she's mm -mm, she's barking up the wrong tree right there. And when she discovered that he wasn't paying her any mind, she was listening to the conversation that he had with the disciples. She said, I've been praying the wrong prayer all the time. And that's just like today. A lot of saints are praying the wrong prayer. Oh, Lord, son of David. Wait a minute now. Sure, he's the son of Abraham, the son of David. But we go further than that. He's the son of God. He's the son of God. He's the express image of the invisible God. You see, he's God in flesh. And so we have to straighten up our prayer life and pray more correctly so we can get more results. And then he, she changed her prayer. She said, oh Lord have mercy. Oh, say, oh, now, now you're talking now. Because Jesus Christ is not only uh, coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he's Lord of all. And so she touched him in that regard. She said, well, he said, it's not right to give children's bread to dogs. She said, well, that's the truth. But even the dogs that are in the houses of these folk, they, those dogs are eating crumbs from the table of the children. And I didn't ask for a plate, a four-course meal. I only asked for a crumb. He said, oh, woman. <laughs> and, you know, the Lord wants us to gasp at our faith. He wants us to, to, our faith to take his breath. Did you hear that? He want our faith to take his breath. And when his breath is taken from him, that's his spirit. 
Man, your faith is something. Oh, woman, your faith is something. And then this is what he said that would make me, and I've said this for years and years, and I believe it just like I read it. He says, be it unto you like you want it. Like you want it. In other words, it's not about what I want you to have. It's what you want you can have because of your faith. Isn't that something? That's, that's powerful. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. So you don't have to pray, Lord, if it be thy will. No, when we have great faith, it's what we will. So you got to make sure you have a faith for the right thing. <laughs> because with great faith, you'll get it. Whether you need it or not, you'll get it. Ask the Israelites when they wanted meat. They got it and they ate it for a whole month and it was coming out of their nostrils. But that's not the thing. I'm looking here at uh, something uh, that really got my attention. Look at Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. We're talking about the great applicator. Mark chapter 10, verse 52. And let me put in 51 and then 52. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? <laughs> the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Now, let's look into this for a moment because the Lord asked this blind man who was obviously blind, what do you want me to do for you? What does that say to us? It says, we think just because we have a problem and God knows what our problem is, that we don't have to talk about what we have need of from him. Lord, you know what I need and you know where I live. And if you will, you will heal. Oh, no, uh -uh. no, 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 no. It doesn't matter what our situation is. We have to let the Lord know what we want in light of the situation. And don't expect us because the Lord already knows that he's not going to put responsibility on us. Be careful for nothing but in everything, what? By prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In other words, we have to talk to him. We really have to talk to him. And then for verse 52 says, And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. <laughs> the Lord says, Go on, man, look, your faith made you whole. Now, if you look at the narrative in the Synoptic Gospels, that this man was crying out, part of the covenant people, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people around him say, shut up. And that's the way it is in the church life today. A lot of folk, they may not say it verbally, but in their hearts, I wish he'd be quiet. I wish she just piped down. She's just too loud. Not knowing what the woman's going through. No matter, I mean, it doesn't matter to folk. Man, they're getting on my nerves. I'm trying to pray. <laughs> well, when they told blind Bartimaeus to shut up, the scripture said he cried the more. He cried the more the more, I mean, a great cry. 
He got louder. Sometimes we have to get, get almost belligerent with these attitudes. And he cried so loud, the Lord said, hey, 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 you, come over here. And when the Lord calls us, guess what? Other people will know it. Other people will know that God called you. And you know what they'll do? They want relational capital. They want to tag along too. They'll say, be a good cheer. He's calling you. You see, from saying shut up to be a good cheer. <laughs> and so that's called spiritual schizophrenia. <laughs> so your faith has made you, go on, man. Your faith made you whole. In other words, when he called Jesus, or Jesus called him, the scripture said he rose up casting away his garment, his insignia of his infirmity. He cast it away. I don't need this anymore. He calling me now. I, that's why I tell people, look, if you believe God for something, act like it. I'll say that one more again. If you believe God for something, act like it. It doesn't matter whether your eyes are open or not. He threw away that garment. And you know, when we act like it, it'll happen. Go show yourself to the priest, all you lepers. He didn't lay hands on them and spit on them and everything. He said, go show yourself. And while they were on the way, they were all healed. Nine kept on going and one returned. He said, who was that? That's a Samaritan. The least likely to return and give him thanks. And he got a little extra. Mm -hmm. The great applicator is faith. Now, if you look at Ephesians 6, verse 16, Ephesians 6, verse 16. Mm -hmm. It says here, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, the apostle says, above all. And the above all means above the helmet of salvation, above the breastplate of righteousness, above the girdle of truth, above being sharp with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I call those steel toe shoes, so if the devil step on your toe, it won't hurt. Above all of the defenses for the, the mind and the heart and all the body parts, Above all, take the shield of faith. And the shield of faith can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And here I go again. Uh, we've been kicked off of YouTube. And what else? Doesn't matter. Can't stop the word. To wear a mask in fear of a virus is a faithless act. It's an act of faithlessness. We don't have faith. We don't have a shield. Because a virus is a wicked device. It's an evil invention. And the scripture says men will be inventors of what? Evil things. And that virus was an invention. And God says, if you have faith, that's your mass. That's your protection. And you don't have to be afraid. I don't care who's afraid for you, you're not afraid for yourself. And when people say you need to protect other folk, I say other folk need what I have. What you talking about?
Christ wasn't walking around with a mask on. He was not walking around with a mask on. And his disciples were not either. And they were having issues in faith. But, but they were close enough to the Lord to say, Lord, save me. Now, this is important for us because if we don't have faith, we're going to start depending on something else. Now, there's a scripture that says that money is a defense. Say again. Uh, wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. But let me tell you this. Look at Jude. Jude just before the revelation look at verse 20 Jude there's only one chapter verse 20 but ye that's you and me beloved building up yourselves on your what most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost we have to build ourselves up on our most holy faith in other words make your shield greater make your shield obviously holy make it most holy purify that faith and the way we do it 1 Peter chapter 1 First Peter chapter 1. Pull in there at verse 7. First Peter 1 7 says that the trial of your faith being what? Much more, Much more precious than gold. Now people tell you buy some gold because the dollar is going to fail. Let me tell you something. The gold is going to fail too. Amen. It's going to eat like a canker. And burn like a fire. So all those that go into the gold. And the silver. And the precious metals. All of it is going to canker. Money may be a defense. But it's not the best. Because it's going to fail. But here. The trial of your faith. Being much more precious than gold. That perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Faith is the most precious commodity for humanity. People who were not born again, people who are not a part of the covenant people, all these folk in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All these people had faith which was a commodity of exchange. It was the great applicator. The faith got what they needed from God. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. And when you go to the great hall of fame of faith in Hebrews 11, by faith, by faith, by faith, through faith, through faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, the great cloud of witnesses. They had faith. I say, we need some faith. And when we get faith, that comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word, the word of God. When we hear what God says about any and everything, God says something about everything. Otherwise, he would not have said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God has said something about everything. I used to think that maybe if I was with the disciples and walking with Jesus, I could have asked him this question. Or I could talk to him about this, that, or the other. But in the scriptures, I found out that God had had conversations with folk from the Garden of Eden. <laughs> All the way through the Revelation. And then we can get in on the conversation if we just read and just study the scriptures and we just search the scriptures but in them you think what 
you think you have eternal life. And they are they, the scriptures, that testify of me. But it said, you will not come to me that you might have life. I said, Lord, the great applicator is faith. And the faith is the shield, which is the greatest defense that we have. Faith is the greatest defense that we have. And we have to get it. And more of it. Don't want to live without it. As a matter of fact, can't live without it. The just shall what? Live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. That we would do a work of faith and a labor of love and patience in our expectations. By grace are ye saved. Through what? Faith. Faith is the great applicator of salvation. Grace is the great applicator of grace. Faith is the great applicator of everything that comes from God. This is why without faith it is impossible to please God. For those of us who go to him, we must be taking the means or the commodity of exchange. We can't go to God without faith. He's not hearing it. And if we're lacking in it, we should be honest and say, Lord, I don't believe like I ought to. Help thy mind unbelief. I have problems believing you. And he says, well, through John, uh, God is greater than our hearts. And he knoweth what? All things. So the, if the heart cannot believe God, go to God with the heart. And say, Lord, I need an open heart surgery. Because there's something going on in my heart that makes it impossible for me to believe you. Every time I talk to you, condemnation shows up. And I wither and I'm discouraged. I know you have that experience. I've had it so many times I can't even count it. But I know what it takes to get over the disappointment of failure. Failure to believe God in the midst, in the crisis. And oftentimes we can't believe God because of something that went on in our lives. And we have to rectify that discrepancy or to clean up our act. So we have to draw near with a what? True heart and what? Full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and then our bodies washed with pure water. We talked about healing yesterday and pure water is the washing of the water by the word and the word of God is quick and powerful all the way down to the joints and the marrow of the bones to heal our blood and clear up our skin and everything else. But if our heart condemns us, we have an access to the Father and an advocate with him. We can go to him in the name of Jesus through the blood of sprinkling and say, Lord, please give me an open heart surgery and sprinkle my heart from a conscience of accusation and purge me from the dead works that I've committed. I thought wrong, I spoke wrong, I did wrong. And he's faithful and just to what? To forgive us. And cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Every bit of it. He's really wanting to. He's faithful and just. Meaning he'll always do it because that's how he operates. Faithful and just. That means when we go to God and ask him for forgiveness, he doesn't have a choice in the matter. He doesn't have a choice. He's faithful and just to forgive us. He's faithful and righteous. That's what that means. That's the way he does it. And the devil will say, well, that's too bad. You can't be forgiven of that. I said, devil, you're a lie. He's faithful and just and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now, we may be paying the price for the seeds that were sown, but we can go and, and, and thank God. And we can take it patiently, knowing that we've been forgiven. If you don't believe it, ask the people in the scripture. <laughs> There's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Glory, hallelujah. 
but we can get there and say, Lord, I need faith. Some of my faith leaked out overnight. Now I need a fresh applicator because I need something today. I need something from you today. And if my heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence that wherever we ask and according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he heard us. We have the petitions that we desire of him. But if our heart condemns us, God is greater than the hearts. Don't want you to stay. Don't want me to stay condemned. He knows all things. Take, your, take our hearts to the heart shop. That's where an open heart surgery comes in. That's where brainwashing comes in. That's where blood transfusion comes in. And you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to know Genesis or Revelation. All you got to do is know that you can get there. And he'll do the rest. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Which means he's our lawyer. He's our advocate. He's our attorney. He's our barrister. And he goes to our defense. And say, Father, he, he doesn't know how to say to you what needs to be said because he, he, you know, he doesn't have a lot, enough experience at the, at, in the court. But I am his or her lawyer. And I'm telling you what they really mean. You see. Father said, I got it. It's adjudicated. You're going away justified. Not just forgiven, but justified. I'm going to treat you like you never sinned. That's what justification is. Forgiveness is that you sin and you've got to be forgiven. But justification treats you like you never sinned. Glory to God. Woo-wee. Thank you. Now your neighbor may not know that you've been justified but don't let their face determine your fate. I've just been to a prayer meeting. My heart wasn't right. But he got a hold of me and he left me like he wanted me to be. In Jesus name we pray. Amen today. All right, come on, let's give many thanks to God on Bishop Smith's behalf. Hallelujah. <clears throat> oh, glory to his name. Hallelujah. Look at your name.